presents. Dr. Ventura is an obstetrician gynecologist since practice, in practice since 2000. She obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the University of California at Davis, USA in 1992. She then received a medical doctorate from Tulln University in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1996. Following her general medical training, Dr. Ventura completed her speciality training in obstetrics and gynecology from American Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington in the year 2000. As a board certified specialist in obstetrics and gynecology, Dr. Ventura has worked in a variety of clinical settings, serving the United States military as an obstetrician and gynecology specialist in Seoul, South Korea and Colorado Springs, USA. In 2003, she left the military and established a private practice in Tacoma, Washington. After four years in enjoyable private practice, Dr. Ventura moved with her husband to Singapore and joined the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the National University of Singapore, where she has worked till, till January 2010. Dr. Ventura frequently takes part in medical missions, including projects in Cambodia, Timor-Leste, Northern India and Africa. She's currently obtaining a Master of Public Health at the University of Liverpool's online program. Please put your hands together to welcome Dr. Ventura. She has an insightful sharing for us. Okay, I'm going to hear, I'm talking about pap smears. And to be honest, I was, in my mind, I had expected an all-female audience because all of my audiences are always all-female. <laughs> so I'm not used to seeing men. Um, so I have to convert that. Uh, but let me first ask, a, a pap smear is a common term. Um, does anybody not know what a pap smear is? If you're a man, go ahead. <laughs> Everybody knows what a pap smear is? OK, good. I think I'm going to argue that you kind of know what a pap smear is. Because a pap smear, uh, I, people come into my office and tell me all the time, oh, I have had an or abnormal pap smear. And I look at the result, and it's completely normal. So there's a lot of things that we think are being evaluated in a pap smear that actually aren't. So first question, do you know, does anybody know why it's called a pap smear? You get a, you get a dollar if you answer the question. Anybody? OK. It's, nobody really knows. Well, I know. Uh, it's, it's like, I don't see, I usually speak to women, so this is going to be a, a, a joke against men, but it's part of my routine. It's about, uh, old men always name themselves after things, right? It's always. So of course, PAP is short for Papalana Kalafanov or something like that. <laughs> it's a Greek name. And thank God we, as a, as a nation or a uh, world, decided to shorten it to PAP so you don't have to go in for your Papalana Kalaf spear every year. You can just go in for your PAP spear. But this man, George PAP, Kalarada, decided to name himself after a vaginal swab. If I was going to name myself after something, I would probably name it something other than a vaginal swab. But that's what he stuck with. And it stuck because it worked. A pap smear, this has been around for 96 years. Old George discovered this in 1920. Uh, at his stage, people with cervical cancer came into the clinic bleeding. I mean, they were bleeding out, or even they might even have something fungating down through the opening of the vagina. That's how advanced cervical cancer was, because you had no real way of assessing it. And so George thought, George Papp said, why don't we find some way that we can uh, get ahead of the game? And we had devices to look up inside the vagina. We have speculums. Maybe some of you men don't know, but it's a little duck-like looking device that we place up into the vagina. And we can look at. Uh, now, there's George right there, so you know. Um, yeah, we can look at the cervix, which is, let me see if I can figure this part out. Yeah, so this is what we're seeing when we're looking at the top of the vagina. And that, I'm going to tell you, is a normal cervix, okay? Because I look at, I look at way too many cervixes. <laughs> but a pap smear that actually might not be normal. So to the naked eye, that might have some precancerous cells on it. And that's what George wanted to figure out. Because if he looked in there and it looked like this fungating, you know, there's this bleeding mass on there, he didn't have to do a pap smear. He knew right away that he needed to take a full biopsy of that, send it to the lab, and say, okay, how, I don't know what they did in 1920, but how they take care of this cancer. But it, when he looked at this cells, it said, is this precancerous cells? And so a pap smear, in George's day, the reason why it was called a pap smear is you took a swab, and you literally 
went inside the cervix and on the outside of the cervix, and you smeared it on a slide. Along with that came mucus and blood and some yeast and some bacteria and all the stuff. And even, I mean, I'm not that old, but we, I used to take my smears and spray them with hairspray. And then we'd look underneath the microscope and we'd think, God, why was that woman just on her menses? Because there's blood all over the place. I can't see anything. And so we would be looking for these little cells. Um, so it was never a perfect test, but you were looking to see if these cells looked abnormal or looked abnormal, or normal or abnormal. Nowadays, maybe about 15 years ago, we started taking that swab. It's on a little brush, which if you've had pap smears, you know it's a little brush. And we put it into a solution, and the blood and the debris kind of get washed away with the solution. So, and then, of course, now it goes through a machine like everything else. And we're, the, there's still a, a guy in, or a gal in the laboratory that looks at these cells and sees if they're abnormal. But, um, but the, the rate of false positive has gone down, but not completely. It's still not a perfect test. And you're only looking at the surface of the cells. You're not looking at, like a, if there was something abnormal, you would take a whole bite of the tissue and you'd be able to see layers of that tissue and see if there's invasive cancer. This is a screening test. So there's a lot of false positives and there can be false negatives as well. So the current uh, recommendation for screening is every three years. That has changed, uh, and it may change in the future, but I'll give you reasons why uh, the current recommendation is every three years uh, soon enough. Um, let's see if we go here. I show you this picture because if you look, it kind of looks like a cervix. <laughs> yeah, so, and he's got cute little big eyes too. The cervix, it, it's important that you understand the histology of, uh, and the microscopic makeup of the cervix to really understand what you should be doing with these results. Because I tell you, I have people come in and panic attacks over abnormal pap smears, and they just need not do that. I've had an abnormal pap smear myself, and look, I'm fine, okay? It happens, and we all live through it, and it, it, it can resolve. So the, the reason I showed this picture is because everybody can feel the inside of their lip. You know, you feel it. It's soft. It's a little sensitive. If you bite it, it hurts. It's moist. If you feel the outside of your lip, it's harder. It is a uh, little less hard to, uh, less easy to uh, cause damage to it. They're two different cell types. Now, the, I, I don't believe I'm not a uh, oral surgeon, but I don't believe that the, the inside cells transition to these outside cells and then slough off into the into your sneezes, but I do know that that's what happens in the cervix. And so the cervix, um, I think, let me go back one cell. Uh, here we go. The cervix has two cell types. These inside cells are glandular. They produce all the mucus that is an important component of sexual relations, of all sorts of things. And those columnar cells, which are these ones here, and I'm not gonna give you a quiz on the name of the cell, so don't worry. But you can see they're different. They actually are, are think of them as uh, big blocks that are squirting out uh, lubrication. Then these outside cells here, they're called squamous cells, like squished. They're squished down. They have a, a different function altogether. But what happens is these inside cells here, they transition to these outside cells here, and that's what's called the transformation zone. And it's an important fact because when we do a pap smear, we are sampling the transformation zone. We're sampling these cells that are transforming from the inside to the outside. And it's a constantly changing process. It changes roughly over about six months. So let's say you have one abnormal cell. Between, let's say, January to June, that cell may be sloughed off on a piece of tissue down the toilet. So if you have abnormal cells, they don't necessarily have to stay there. Uh, and that's why you shouldn't freak out so much about abnormal pap smear. Um, Let's see, go down here. This one here, again, it's just for demonstration purposes, but I think you can tell here, especially since they're labeled mild, moderate, and severe, uh, and the word precancerous, it has the word cancer in it, which of course freaks everybody out, and including me. If somebody tells you that you have precancer, you don't hear the pre, <laughs> you just hear cancer, you know, and then you stop listening to everything. And I think that's, Singapore started doing nationwide screening, if I am correct on this, uh, in 2004. It was fairly recently that it became a, uh, a public health concern. Whereas to say, if you look, I, I think it's either Canada or the UK was in the late 60s or the early 70s. Um, so there, there's a, 
people obviously got pap smears here between before 2004, but many didn't. There's kind of a generational uh, skip here. And I can tell you, I practiced, as you heard from my bio, for several years in the States, and I never did a pap smear and saw a cancer in, in the US, never, once. I was here maybe, I came here in 2007, I was here maybe a month, and I got my first pap smear with a cancer, and I saw it, and I learned the lingo. I said, cannot la, I called the lab, and I said, this can't be, because you don't have a pap smear that say cancer, but it was. It was an older woman who just had never had any screening before. And the reason why this is an important concept is because if you have an abnormal, let's see, you have this right here. If it, it decides to progress, to go to here, you think maybe that will happen in six months because your doctor told you to come, come back in six months if you have an abnormal pap smear. But that's not true. It cannot happen in six months. It might happen in 10 years or it might never happen at all. The problem is we don't know who's going to progress and who's not going to progress. But it's definitely a slow process. So if you have somebody, like I think there was, um, if I'm correct on this, there was a 28-year-old reality TV star that died in the UK from cervical cancer. And the reality is, is that the UK doesn't screen until 25, which is what Singapore screens at. The US screens at 21. We used to screen at age 18. The ball keeps changing. But really, these are public health guidelines. This reality star, and I don't know who, I can't, I'm not British, so I don't know what she is, but I know she died at age 28 and I was shocked because it does take like 10 years to develop cervical cancer, which just means that she probably was sexually active in her teenage years, which is very probable. And so when you talk to, even though the policy is age 25 here, if you know somebody or your children or your neighbor and you know that they're, they're engaging in sexual activities, and I'm not saying they have to go in right away. In fact, we discourage that you go in right away. Uh, but you know, a couple years later, um, then maybe they do need to go in at age 21 instead of age 25 to catch it early. Because if this person's on a rate of progression, if we do uh, excisional procedure here, then obviously she's not gonna progress, okay? Now, to go from severe to cancer, you think that's right around the corner. But the reality is, too, that that, too, could either not happen at all or happen in 10 years. Um, and if you look at some statistics here, and all these, you guys, because there's brochures outside, but you know about the vaccination for HPV, right? There are a lot of nonsense. Do you know what HPV is? Okay, HPV is human papilloma virus, okay? It is a virus that has been known for a long time to cause changes in the cells of the cervix, okay? We didn't start testing for HPV until, oh, maybe 10 years ago. And even then, there's a lot of people that get tested for it that don't need to, and we'll talk about that later on. But we have th this statistic, which is, I, I looked it up, it's just very consistent with today's statistics, uh, well, this was printed from a talk that I did in 2008. So they're the same thing. If you have, if you go into your gynecologist or your GP or whoever's doing your pap smear and it comes back with mild changes, this, oops, this change here, and you know it has the word precancer, so you've already panicked, right? You've already started Googling. Um, but what you didn't find when you started Googling was you didn't find the statistic that said that only 1% of the time you're going to end up with cancer. So invasion means cancer. The rest of it, two-thirds of it, is actually going to regress. The persistent progress, you can see they're right in the middle there. So my abnormal pap smear was this mild change, and it regressed. You, you're told to go back. The guidelines for Singapore, which couple the guidelines for the U.S. and the U.K. and Australia, I, I, I will say, uh, ashamed of my fellow colleagues, that I have seen um, people that don't adhere to the guidelines, but the, the guidelines say, bring this person back. Well, you, well, we can do another procedure to actually look at the cervix under a microscope. It's called a coposcope. Copal means vagina, scope is telescope. So we're looking at the cervix under magnification to get a better view, because again, this is the naked eye. And then we can take spot-directed biopsies. But putting that aside, all you know is that you saw the words precancer, which you translated to cancer. You saw the word mild, and so now you panicked, and you need to look at this, this value right here. It's two-thirds, it's going to resolve. So you go back in six months, 
And that's what the guidelines say. And in six months, it's still there. So you're annoyed. You've stopped panicking by this point in time because uh, you realize you're still here. But now you're annoyed because it's not going away. So then you're told to come back in another six months. And this could go on and on and on. So I tell my patients, I give them an option. If you're at the mild changes and you are, say you're a young 28-year-old woman, uh, there's a ch after about two years, you get annoyed with going into the doctor and it's expensive. We can do an excisional procedure to remove this and then you can carry on with your life, although this could happen again, okay? So it's not like once you get a free for an abnormal pap smear, it doesn't mean that you're not going to not get another abnormal pap smear. But there's no rushed clinically. Now, there's a different scenario. If you're a 55-year-old woman, you have an immunodeficiency disease, so you can't really fight off any uh, abnormal changes, uh, you're done with your reproductive changes, then yeah, then maybe we will act sooner on this uh, mild changes. So mild changes, again, low progression, every six months come back and, and have the discussion with your doctor. Ten minutes already? Oh, okay. Um, okay, I'll progress. <laughs> Uh, the second one, moderate changes, you can see again only 5% regress and then severe changes, 12%, which is still 12%. I mean, that's not 100%, but if I had a severe change on my pap smear, I would go and have an excisional procedure. And, but I've had a pregnant patient that has severe changes and I wasn't about to operate on her cervix uh, while she was pregnant, so we waited till afterwards you know, about six or eight weeks afterwards, we did the procedure and it came mild, came back mild. So this is not a linear trend. You don't go from moderate to severe to cancer. It can go back and forth, okay? So keep, keep that in mind. It, the bottom line here, to move things along, is that it all comes down to HPV, human papilloma virus. It is a sexually transmitted disease. Cervical cancer is a sexually transmitted disease. Most people don't think of it that way, but it all comes from this virus. And so you think, you know, everybody who has cervical cancer has had a sexually transmitted disease. That is correct. If you look at the statistics from when they started doing all these vaccination studies, which again is about 10 or 15 years ago, and they were screening all sorts of university age students, that was the primary target for the research, they found that 80% of them tested positive for HPV. So it means if you didn't have HPV, you weren't normal. Only 20% of the people didn't have it. So not 80% of those people, it, they didn't all have cancer. They didn't even all have abnormal uh, pap smears. They just have HPV. So uh, take a warning, when you go into your doctor, and again, I get a lot of uh, second opinions for this too, they come in and they tell me they're dying because they have this abnormal reading, and they have a positive HPV and a normal pap smear. And I say, what's the problem? And they say, yeah, but I have a positive HPV. And I say, well, who doesn't? Everybody has a positive HPV. What I want to know is what's it doing? Did it integrate into the cells? Like, Because most of the time, the HPV is going to come in, it's going to play around in the little playground of your cervix, and then it's going to bounce off. And it might come back and come back in again. And so I've ha had people where I've tested for HPV, and six months later, I tested it's gone, and six months later, they tested it's, it's uh, correct, and then they blame their husband for having a, a cheating spell. You know, all this stuff goes on, you know? And no, it's just the way that nature is going on. It's, the issue is, is it incorporating into your DNA? If it's incorporating into the DNA of the cell, then those are the unlucky 10% that are going to develop into cervical cancer. Okay, so, and we don't know who that is. So that's why you need to just follow up with your, your doctor. But it all comes down to HPV. Now, you know about this vaccination. Uh, there's two types. This is the Cervarex, which I think, uh, I mean, there's two brochures outside. I don't know if you've seen this. This is the one that's a little bit more popular in Singapore for marketing reasons. It's all over the buses and all everything else. And then this one is Gardasil, and this is more popular in the US for marketing reasons. It's all over buses and everything else. So it's all about who gets there first. But the reality is I'm fine with either one of them. It is a vaccine like any other vaccine. It can have side effects like any other uh, vaccine. Um, but for the most part, it, it is safe. I recommend it to my patients. I personally never had a uh, person that was, had an adverse reaction outside of the ouch and a little maybe fainting spell because they just didn't like the situation that was going on. But other than that, no severe ad, uh, adverse effects from, from my personal experience, and I've given out a lot of this vaccine. It's not 
a cure for your abnormal pap smear. It's prevention from you getting an uh, uh, ins- infection of HPV, but even then, it's not 100%. There is 100 strains of HPV, and I'm sure that there's some guy in a lab right now finding another strain, okay? This is what they do. They just keep coming up with more stuff. At the time, last time I checked, only 15 of them were responsible for cervical cancer. Uh, There's several that are responsible for warts, you know, the genital warts that come on the vagina and the penis, and they are psychologically a huge problem to see, you look down and that you see you have a a wart. Are you going to die from a wart? Maybe from embarrassment, but that's it. You're not going to die from cancer from a wart. So the Gardasil, and this is a new generation of Gardasil, it does uh, protect you against, oh no, this is, this one's the old generation. Uh, It does protect you against uh, two strains of the virus that are responsible for warts. Reduces your chance of getting worse by 70%. Okay, great, but it's, I personally feel like you need to go for more of a, uh, the Gardasil has 70% coverage for these uh, the strains that cause cervical cancer, and the uh, Cervarex says they save 80%. It really doesn't matter 70, 80%, because the bottom line is it's not, it's not 100%. So you don't give your daughter the jab or you don't get yourself the jab and then say, okay, I'm good. I never have to go back to that awful gynecologist ever again. (laughs) That's not the case because you still can, 20 or 30% of the time, you can still develop cervical cancer. It just reduces the chance of it. So that's that's the rationale behind this uh, vaccine. And they're all uh, the same. Gardasil is, you get it now, you get it in two months and then you get in six months. And Cervarex says you get it now in one month and six months. And there's uh, um, always the question about, well, I'm a gynecologist, so I give it to the women. Should be getting it to the boys? The answer is yes. Uh, it's, it was slow to follow politically. Australia was the first one to jump on board, which said all the boys and girls get it because as he said, it takes two to tango, you know, like it, you can't spread the virus on your own. So they started vaccinating their boys. The U.S. has just gotten involved. Uh, I know that my friends in Singapore are vaccinating their boys. Um, and and I, I tell you, I, I don't see boys. I see my husband at night. That's it. You know, I don't have any men come into my clinic occasionally to discuss fertility. But I... When I, when I first started practicing, it was before this Gardasil, all these vaccines, and I never got a chance to sit down with a young teenage girl. They always came to me when it was either too late, <laughs> they already got, they got pregnant, or they got a sexually transmitted disease, or they were now older and now looking for contraception or whatever it was, but they never got that, like, that talk okay, you're 15 years old, let's talk about your menstrual cycle, your mom's outside, do you have any questions? You know, I went to the American school and the Australian school to give give talks, and it was supposed to be on, uh, you know, sexual behavior and all this stuff. All the girls wanted to know about menstrual problems, they wanted to know about yeast infection, they wanted to know about typical gynecologic stuff that they're not necessarily gonna walk up to mom and say, is this discharge normal, you know? So they wanna talk to a doctor, and I feel like with this, a little invention, I can use it as an excuse, and the moms can use it as an excuse. So I have so many 14-year-olds coming into my clinic, as opposed to going to the pediatrician to get their vaccination, they come into me. Now, I'm not gonna do an exam on them. I might not even talk to them. I might ask them if they're sexually active, if I have a suspicion, but that's not, it's, it's all, all to get them in the, in the door. So I can ask them, you know, tell them what a pap smear is. Tell them what, um, uh, you know, what the exam is, and you're not going to get it now, you're not going to get it for another five or six years, but he puts it in their mind, and you'd be surprised how much they open up to me. I mean, they just, they start asking all sorts of questions that, and, and I had to think about them, I said, oh yeah, when I was 15, I had no clue either, you know, none of us knew, and but now they have the internet, but that's good and bad, as we all know, I mean, they find out way too much stuff that's wrong, um, but it's a great way to get your daughters or nieces or nephews into the gynecologist, and oh, by the way, you're going to get a shot. You know, so you, you, you give them your, that's why you get them in there, because otherwise they won't come. And then I would recommend that stay with your daughter if you want to have the conversation together, but keep in mind when your daughter asks you to leave the room, it's not because they want to disclose that they're having sex. I would tell you most of my the women, the mothers think that's the case, but I can tell you that's not the reality. They just want to talk about private matters that they feel uncomfortable with talking about their mother. So go ahead, bring your daughters into the room and, and leave. Let them have like this little professional uh, conversation that helps them feel a little bit better about their emergent sexuality. 
And uh, I think that's, oh yeah, little token slide. Cancer is a rare outcome of a common infection. So for every one million women that get HPV, only 1,600 develop cervical cancer. And so you need to keep that in mind too, because the HPV is out there right now that people just get so worried that they have it. And as we discussed, who doesn't? Um, and I think that's it. Thank you, Dr. Ventura, for such an insightful sharing with us. Um, are there, uh, does anyone have any questions? Our roving mics are around the, around the room and our colleagues will approach you if you'd like to ask any questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Tool. Good afternoon. Um, I've done my total hysterectomy in 24 years ago. Do I need a pap smear? No, you don't. I'm, I'm, well, okay, let me ask you all a person. It wasn't for cancer, right? You didn't have a cervical yeah, yeah, your hysterectomy for no, cancer? No, Because that's the only yeah. reason why you would uh, change yeah, that. Okay. Now, you, I, I mean, it doesn't mean you shouldn't go see your gynecologist because I don't know if you still have your ovaries in place. And you can't, rare, it's rare, but you can get cancer of the vulva. So it's a good idea to just get an inspection of the vaginal area. But we used to say a pap smear every three years after a hysterectomy, but now we don't. It's, it, the yield is too low. Uh, regarding the HPV, mm -hmm. only you do once in your lifetime? Once in your, well, three jabs, it's a booster. Yeah. Yeah. And for right now, it's, it's once. I know that years ago, the Gardasil said that their, their antibody levels were decreasing or after about five years, and they were pardon me, considering doing a booster, but that never came to be. So obviously, there's some guy in the lab that said that wasn't necessary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any other question? Oh, okay. okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Dr. Ventura, please remain on stage. We would like to present you with a token of appreciation. I should present you with a token of appreciation. 